Hey, I'm Lauren. I'm with Active Music. This is Joe from Active Music. James from Active Music. Steph from Active Music. It's Anthony, a part of Active Music. Danny, I'm with Active Music. This is Richard from Active Music. We're so excited to let you guys know about our new single, With Me. With Me. Our single, With Me, on May 29th. It comes out on May 29th. Our new single, With Me, is coming out May 29th. It's available on all streaming sites. So check it out on May 29th. May 29th. May 29th. May 29th. With Me comes out May 29th. And you can find it anywhere that you listen to music. All streaming platforms. Every streaming platform. Anywhere that you stream music. Don't forget. Don't forget. Put it in your calendar. Whatever you gotta do. Check it out. Check it out. Look forward to sharing it with you. You're gonna love it. We can't wait to share it with you. Check it out. Good morning, Active Church. Thank you for joining us. My name is Diana. And I'm Shauna, and we're on the team here. Hey, if this is your first time watching, thank you for joining us this morning. We are so honored that you would spend your morning with us. Do me a favor, let us know that you are new by commenting, hey, I'm new in the comment section below. Let's also take a moment right now in the comment section to say hello to one another, leave a waving emoji or a thumbs up. Let us know that you're here with us this morning. Also, make sure you hit that share button because you have no idea who needs to hear this message today. Hey, and something else we wanna share with you, class of 2020, this is for you. We wanna celebrate you big. So on Sunday, May 31st from five to seven, we are throwing a huge graduation parade just for you. Come join us, we'll be having a DJ, photos, and a free gift just for you. Help us celebrate you by clicking the link in the description. Let us know you're gonna be here. Active Church, we can only do these things because of your generosity. Your giving changes the world. And there are two ways that you can give with us this morning. The first way is online at activechurches.com. Just click on that giving button. And the second way is our favorite way to give. Just text the amount to the number on the screen. It's so easy. Hey, we are going to go into time of worship right now. And I love this time because it's a time where we can pray and worship together. And if you're not familiar with worship, it's simply praying with music. So I'm gonna invite you guys, go ahead and stand up, turn the volume up, and sing as loud as you want. And can I just say, Active Church, welcome home. Sing great. 
first blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest phrase But holy trust in Jesus' name My hope is built on nothing less Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame But holy trust in Jesus' name Christ alone, the cornerstone The weak made song Savior's love through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Darkness seems to hide His face. I rest on His unchanging. that was. Hey, if you haven't heard, Active Music is releasing their new single May 29th called With Me. I know that this song has been an incredible anthem of hope for my family and I during this season. Help us get the word out by sharing the graphics and the videos on your social media platforms because we believe that somebody needs to hear this song. It'll be available on all streaming platforms. Another exciting thing coming up here at Active is Kids Blitz. Hey, if you've got littles, kinder to fifth grade, you do not want to miss this. June 23rd through the 25th is Kids Blitz at Home. And we are so excited about this. And if you don't know what Kids Blitz is, it is a high energy three day event where your kids can engage with each other and with the story of God. We will be letting you know when you can come onto our campus to pick up Blitz boxes. These Blitz boxes will contain everything you and your kids need for those three days, including snack, crafts, the lessons, everything you need. I know my kids are so excited for Kids Blitz and cannot wait to pick up their boxes. So be sure to check out social media for more details. And here at Active, we believe in creating fun, engaging, and 
environments for all of our kids in all seasons. And this is only possible because of your giving. There are two ways that you can give with us today. You can visit us at activechurches.com and just click the give link, or you can text the amount to the number on the screen. Right now, we're gonna hear from Pastor Mike. We're in our second week of Just Curious. And today he walks us through the question, does God have a plan? I know I ask myself that question all the time. But before we dive into this message, would you join me in a moment of prayer? Dear God, we just thank you so much for these opportunities. And even though we are scattered, we know that we are still gathered. Lord, I ask that you would speak to us through Pastor Mike as he shares what you have for us this morning. In your son's name we pray. Hey Alexa. Hey Alexa. Hey Alexa. Hey Siri. Hey Siri. Hey Siri. Hey Google. Hey Google. Got it, Bobby. I'm listening. Hey Siri, who is God? Who is God? It's all a mystery to me. Why should I follow God? Why should I follow God? I don't have an answer for that. Does God have a plan for me? Does God have a plan? Now playing God's Plan by Drake. Go ahead. Yes. I'm here. The will of God, divine will, or God's plan is the concept of a God having a plan for humanity. Well, welcome to Active Churches Online, everyone. My name is Mike, and I'm the lead pastor here at Active Church, and I got some of the team joining me, so thanks for being here, guys. And thank you for joining us, however you're accessing Active Online, whether you're watching or you're listening. It's such a privilege to have you a part of the story that God is writing here. We are in the middle of a series called Just Curious, and we're wrestling through some of the big questions about God. And so here's what I'd like to do today. I wanna to start with a personal story, and then I wanna give you one of those big questions, and then we'll wrestle through the answer together. And then at the end of our time, I wanna ask you what I would call a story-shaping question, all right? So first, quick personal story. This year marks my 19th year at Active Church. So they haven't gotten rid of me yet, so I'm thankful for that. I have served in a few different positions here at Active, and each one has been life-giving and been exciting. But I can remember three distinct moments in my career here at Active where I began to look for a new opportunity. Not because there was something wrong at Active or there was something going on that I didn't enjoy. I just felt like it was time for me to look for something else. And each one of those times, I received the same answer, no. The first two times, they said no to me, which is deflating and defeating and discouraging. But I felt it was right and they felt it was right. The third time, I said no. They thought I was right for the position and I said, I don't think I am. And I remember each time driving away from those interviews, from those conversations, and I was really frustrated with God. Even though I said no in that last time, even though when they said no, I agreed that it was probably appropriate. I was really frustrated with God and I asked a question that I think a lot of us ask. And the question was this, so what's the plan? What's the plan, God? And I think a lot of us ask that question. In fact, Google released the top three questions that people have been searching for during this COVID crisis when it has to do with God and religion and with church. And one of those questions was this, does God have a plan for me? And I think all of us want to know if God has a plan for us. And deep in that question, deep within our soul, the reason why we're asking that question is because we want to know, God, have you thought about me? God, do I matter to you? God, does my life have significance? And so we're asking that question, not because we just want to know if there's some sort of plan. We're asking that question because we want to know, like, does God really think about me and care about me? Has he had some forethought about my life. And the reason why we ask that question is because of the things that are happening around us. We look at our life and we ask this question, is this how I want my life to be? And so we push back. Maybe you push back and ask the question, God, is there a plan for me? Because you don't know the plan. And if you're like me, you like to have control over a lot of things, right? Like I like to be able to be a little bit OCD about my life. And if I don't know the plan, then that must mean that there's not a plan. Or maybe you ask the question, God, is there a plan for me? Because you want to know if there really is a God. Because you're not sure you believe that there is a God, let alone that there's a God who has a plan for you. Or maybe I think the one that all of us can relate to is we ask God if there's a plan because maybe we think we've missed the plan or we've messed up the plan. When I said no 
to that third opportunity, quite honestly, I thought I missed the plan. It messed with me for about three months. And because I married a really great wife, she was a really great encouragement, I was reminded that perhaps me saying no was a part of what God wanted me to do. But it was unsettling in my heart. Maybe, maybe you think that you've messed up the plan. Because you look at your life, you look at your behavior, you look at the things that you're doing, and you're wondering why a loving God would even have anything to do with you. I think ultimately the reason why we ask this question, does God have a plan for me, is because of the interruptions that we face in life. When we face interruptions, it messes up the nice rhythm of life. It messes up our control of life. In fact, I'll show you, I think a lot of us want to live life this way. We want to have a life that's scheduled, nice little boxes, maybe some really nice writing, and every single one of our boxes is filled. And I think some of you, like me, we just want to check those boxes. And so we would ask God, like, God, if, if you have a plan for me, can you make it like this? <laughs> and I think the reason why we ask the question is because the answer to that question in the, the life that we're living and what we see around us is nothing like this. It doesn't meet this standard. We can't check these boxes. And so we struggle with that question. Like, God, is there a plan? Because it doesn't seem like there's a plan. It doesn't seem like there's any thought. It doesn't seem like I have significance because the life that I'm living, it's a bit chaotic. And this is why I love the scriptures. Not just because I'm a Christian, but because it's written by men and women who were pursuing God and they were trying to figure God out like you and I are trying to figure God out. They went through crisis like we're going through crisis. We're doing church at home. We can't gather together because of a very infectious virus and they had to figure out life like we had to figure out life and they looked at their life and they said it just doesn't seem like there's a plan because it feels chaotic. And this is why I love these real stories of these real men and women who are trying to figure out God. One of them is Paul. We talk often about Paul here at Active Church. And I want to share something with you today that I believe will be life-changing. And I know that that might seem a bit dramatic, but I really believe that it could shift your perspective and help you see God and how God sees you in a significant way. And so I want to take you to something that Paul writes because he offers us something that's better than a plan. But before we get there, I just want you to get some context for who this Paul guy really is. You guys know that he had a chaotic life and he actually writes about it in one of the letters that he is encouraging a church with and it's found in the pages and documents we call the scriptures. It's a letter called 1 Corinthians and just a little snippet of what he writes about his life. He's summarizing some of the things that he's been through, some of the interruptions that he has faced because he's wondering if God has a plan for him and he's helping to bring a really great answer, something better than a plan to those that are reading. And here's a little snippet of his life, his biography, so to speak. He says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, five times I've received 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a day and a night on the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in the country, at sea, from false believers. I've labored and I've toiled and I've gone often without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and I've gone often without food. I've been cold and I've been naked and besides everything else, I face the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. It feels like he was starring on the TV show Survivor as he writes that out, right? And as he writes, he's not complaining. He's just helping us to see that he knows what we're thinking and what we're feeling. And then what he says next is remarkable. It's in a different letter. He actually helps us to see that maybe perhaps there's something better than a plan for his life, for my life, and even your life. And I want to show it to you because I think that it'll change everything for you. So if you do have a Bible with you or if you have the Bible app on a smart device on your phone, would you turn to the letter of Romans in the New Testament in the Bible? Romans chapter 8, 
starting in verse 28. And what I want to do is I just want to walk through it piece by piece, step by step, because it's powerful and it's significant and it's life-changing. And I don't want you to miss what Paul is communicating to you and to me. So Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 28, it begins this way. And we know that in all things, God works. All things, God works. Which means that God is up to something in every moment. Even in those moments when God feels distant, even in those moments when God feels like he's very inattentive to you, in those moments when God feels like he's being very quiet, or even in those moments where you're not sure that God is even near. Paul's conviction and what he's writing to you and to me and to these first readers is that in all moments, God is at work. God doesn't take a day off. And he wants you and I to know that before he gets into anything else. That God is always up to something in your life and in mine. And he says this, that I know and we know that in all things, God works. And what is he working for? For the good. That God is looking to accomplish something in every single moment. He's looking to accomplish something good. It doesn't mean that the moment is going to feel good. It doesn't mean that the moment is going to look good. But that God is using this moment to point to something that's greater than what you could come up with. Pointing to something that's good. That's shaped by him. That's defined by him. And that he can speak into. And so God is working in all things, according to Paul. And he's working for the good. Taking these moments of pain and struggle and turning them into moments of power and courage. Because God is working for you, not against you. In all things. And then Paul gets to that moment that's better than the plan. And you might know this verse if you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, this might be new to you. And so I want you to lean in wherever you're at on the couch. Maybe you're driving and you're listening. Just lean in. Pay attention to the road, but lean in. Because this next thing is significant and it's powerful and it's life-changing. Paul says this, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. Purpose is a cultural buzzword. It's not just a church word, it's a cultural word. We all want to know our purpose. Because when we know our purpose, what that helps us to understand about our life is that we matter. Like things can't move forward without us. Like, for example, I have this book here. And this book tells a story. And each page in this book helps move the story forward. And if I, don't tell anybody, all right, if I rip this page out, sorry, Joe, if this was your book, but, <laughs> but if I rip this page out, the story is incomplete because it can't be finished without that piece of the story, without that page. And what purpose announces over you and over me is that there's a reason for our existence, that we matter. You might have been a surprise to mom and dad, but you were not a surprise to your heavenly father, the God of the universe. God works in all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That God has something far better than, hang on, far better than a plan. He's got a purpose. He's not looking to check the boxes of life for you. God is looking to give you life. When he shaped you and designed you, he had a life in mind, a purpose in mind. Even if you think that you have messed it up or you have missed it, God is announcing to you through the words of Paul, there's nothing you can do to throw off your purpose. You matter. You're significant. And then my favorite part of what he says comes next. 
And I just want you to know, it's heavy, it's big language. I want us to walk it through together. He says this, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You ready? Verse 29, for those that God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image and likeness of his son. So the purpose that God has given you and given me is that we can be conformed to the image of his son, God's son, Jesus Christ. Now, it's big language. I've been a Christian for a long time. I was eight years old when I came to know Christ and I'm not eight years old anymore. And so I've been a Christian a long time. And even I read that and it's big language. So could I just pause and could we walk it through, even if you're a Christian, could we pause and walk it through? And if you're not a Christian, man, I want you to lean in because this is so significant for you. This moment is powerful because what Paul is communicating is a deeply held belief that Christians are holding on to for generations. And it's this, if you want to know what God is like, you look at Jesus. So if you have a question about God, look at the person and work of Jesus. But then he takes it even further. According to God and what Paul is writing here, if you want to know what Jesus is like, then you look at the church, at Christians, at us. Now, immediately you might think, well, the church and Christians and us, we don't get it right all the time. You're right. But what Paul is saying here is that God is up to something in you and in me. That he has given us a purpose and that purpose is to reflect to the world around us, to those that we love, those that we like, those that we don't like so much but need to like, that we are to reflect the person and work of Jesus in what we say and in what we do. How we feel about Jesus will come out and how we speak and treat those around us. They will know who God is by looking at you, by looking at me, by looking at us. This is what he's saying here. Now, Christians, we, we long for this. We wanna be more like Jesus. We wanna be conformed to the image of Jesus. Now, I just wanna bring some clarity there. You and I becoming more like Jesus is not us losing what makes us uniquely us. God isn't putting us on a conveyor belt and going, all right, I'm going to put you here and you're going to look like them. And everybody that gets off the conveyor belt is all going to look the same and sound the same and be the same. That's not what he's inviting us into. This is more about you and I living a life that's irresistible. That people go, I don't know if I believe that, but I love how they live. I don't know if I would go to church, but I would want to hire somebody who goes to church. I don't know if I would trust in Jesus, but I would want my kids to date somebody that does. Are you with me? This is what Paul is writing about, and this is what Christians long for. So if you're not a Christian, I can understand why this language can be really, really heavy. And I think that there, there needs to be an announcement that it's okay if you're like, I don't know about the word conform, and I don't know about this idea, and that, that's completely okay. Could I just tell you, here's why we long for this. Christians believe that Jesus is the greatest human example of love, of humility, and of telling a better story. And what does our world need? It needs love, it needs to be served, and they need to have the hope that there's a better story possible. And that's why Paul writes this. Paul says, I want everyone to tell a better story. And Christians believe, active church believes, Paul believes that the better story is found in the person and work of Jesus. Yeah. Have you ever been around a moment, a situation where maybe somebody saw something good and then they see it and they kind of maybe have a look of shock on their face and then they respond in this kind of typical way, but I think it's an appropriate way. They see something, someone doing good, and then they go, oh, faith in humanity restored, right? <laughs> I've said that, maybe you've said that, maybe you've said that. That's actually an appropriate response because they, what they're saying in that moment is they have seen a lot of bad and then they saw something or someone good and they go, oh, faith in humanity restored. It's, it's as if they're saying, oh, there's something good in the world still. And that 
is what Paul says God is working out in you and in me as we trust in Jesus. That the way that we speak and the way that we live would cause other to go, others to go, oh, faith in humanity restored because there's something good still. It points to something good, it points to someone good, and it reminds people that there is good in the world. So to come back to what Paul is saying here, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those that God knew beforehand, he predestined to be conformed to the likeness and the image of his son. He's pointing out that there's something better than a plan. There's a purpose. And God moving us in that direction is God using those interruptions in our life where we begin to question if God has a plan and has thought about us. God using those interruptions in our life to bring about something good. It's like God's announcement. I'm not going to waste this. I'm not going to waste this pain. I'm not going to waste this struggle. I'm not going to waste this hurt. I'm going to use this. Doesn't mean that the situation was good, but I'm going to use this terrible, painful situation and I'm going to bring out something good. Maybe it helps answer that question. Why does bad things happen to good people? Why does bad things happen to good people? And maybe perhaps bad things happen so that we can see what is really good. It draws a dividing line and it helps me to know that bad, that good. It helps bring clarity. Because I think sometimes in my own opinion, and maybe in your opinion, in my own perspective, maybe in your perspective, we use phrases like my truth and your truth. I think sometimes we like to blur the lines between what is bad and what is good. And God goes, I want you to see the greatest good. I want you to see me. I want you to see Jesus. I want you to see love. I want you to experience humility. I want you to tell a better story. And so God takes these moments of interruptions and he turns it to good so that you and I can see the greatest good. The God who is good. And just, if I could take it a little bit further, Christians have never believed, we've never believed in a God who doesn't allow bad things to happen to good people. We've never believed that. And here's why. You ready? You ready? Because we believe that the worst possible thing happened to the best possible person. Yeah. We believe that Jesus is the perfect image of God in human form. Didn't sin felt everything we felt, understands everything we understand, but we believe that he went through the worst possible thing and he was the best possible person. And here's, here's the kicker for me, and hopefully it is for you. From that worst possible thing came the best possible result. I don't have a job if Jesus doesn't come and die and rise again. <laughs> and we don't have hope or love or humility we don't get to talk about telling better stories. Generosity means nothing without Jesus going through the worst possible thing and bringing us the best possible result. Forgiveness, love, life everlasting. So my friends, interruptions, they're going to come. You know this and I know this. And what Paul is saying is that there's this freedom of choice and how we're going to respond to those interruptions and if we choose to do what we want to do and it's bad, the results will be, bad. will be bad. And if we choose to do what we want to do and it's good, the results could bring about the greatest good. What Paul is simply saying here is this. You and I have the freedom to choose and believe that the best option in life is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because when we trust in Jesus, the God of the universe is with us and in us. And in those moments of interruption, in those moments of pain, in those moments of struggle, in those moments where we're wondering, God, is there a plan? God announces, I've given you a purpose and I'm working all things out for the good, the greatest good. So here's that story shaping question I promised you. You ready? At the end of your life, would you rather fulfill a plan or would you rather live in your purpose? At the end of your life, would you rather check all of the boxes? Look what we did. We fulfilled a plan. Yay. <laughs> or would you rather live in 
your purpose? That's the question we have to wrestle with today. And that's the tension that you and I have to live with today. I want to live in purpose. I want to be more like Jesus. Because I believe that's where better stories are found. And I want to invite you to say yes to that. And so if you're watching this for the very first time, if faith is new to you, if pursuing God is new to you, then I want to invite you to take a a big, bold step. I want to invite you to say yes to Jesus. It's you saying that you believe in what he said and you believe in what he did. That he is a real person who really lived and really died and his tomb is really empty. It's as simple as saying yes to Jesus. I'm going to trust you with my life. And that decision is not a decision that you make by yourself. It's not a private decision. It's a personal decision, but it's not a private decision. And we want to invite you to share that publicly in a bold and courageous way. And so I want to invite you to do one of two things. Would you right now, if you're watching this, would you comment, I said yes, so that our team and our church could celebrate with you All we want to do is just give you a high five emoji. We want to give you that birthday hat with a little little birthday decoration. We want to celebrate that with you. Would you put that in the comment? I said yes. If you aren't ready to go as public with that, would you text the word? I said yes. All one word. I said yes to the number that you see on the screen. I said yes to the number that you see on the screen. The greatest decision you will ever make in your life is the decision to trust in the God who gave you life. And it will help bring clarity to the question, God, is there a plan? Have you thought about me? And God will answer with a loud and resounding yes, because he has something greater than a plan. He has a purpose. So could I pray for you? Let's pray together. So God, I pray for those that are riding the tension right now. Do I wanna fulfill a plan or do I wanna live in my purpose? Those that are riding the tension of, should I, should I say yes? Should I write it out on a comment? Should I text that? God, would you give them courage to have them step into this new way of life? A life that's with you, a life that is about you, and a life that helps us to tell a better story. So God, would you invite us and fill us and give us courage to take that first step to say yes. And we thank you for each person that has texted or indicated that they have said yes. We celebrate with them today because they are trusting in the good God who makes all things And it's in his name that we pray all these things. Amen and amen and amen. What an awesome message from Pastor Mike today. If you said yes, we want to celebrate you. Let us know in the comments, I said yes, or you can text the number on the screen, I said yes, all one word, because we want to celebrate you. And we know what an important decision this is. Active Churches, it's because of your generosity that we can tell a better story through the life change that is happening all around the world. And there are two ways that you can give with us today. You can visit activechurches.com and just click the give button, or you can text the amount to the number on the screen. And lastly, class of 2020, we are going to celebrate you with a graduate graduation parade on May 31st from 5 to 7. We can't wait to see you there. We can't wait to celebrate with you and we can't wait to see you next week, Active Church.